Please welcome the CEO of Mylan, Heather Bresch, here with Steve Clemens, The Atlantic's Washington Editor-at-Large. Good morning, good morning. I feel like we should give you all medals, the third day medals. Thank you for all being here. Hey, what we didn't announce about Heather Bresch is she happens to be the daughter of Senator Joe Manchin. So how is he gonna vote? So you promise not to tell anybody? I promise. I think he's down to two choices. <laughs> that is so bad. Um, Heather, let me ask you, you know, you, you went through an ordeal where with the EpiPen crisis and whatnot, you became the face of, of drug pricing, high cost, this big debate. And it's, it's, it's healthcare today is really evolving as a major um, election issue. Uh, in both this election as we, and as definitely as we look at 2020. And I'm interested in whether, you know, given now that people know you, how, how do you feel about that becoming an election issue? How do you feel about that pressure? So look, I said two years ago that if EpiPen could serve as a catalyst to help illuminate the issues in the system, and it could, we could work towards a solution, then it will have been worth it. And I still mean that today. And I think two years later, there's been much more robust dialogue. I won't say that we fixed it, and that's why it's an election issue. And it's gonna maintain to be, a, it's gonna remain an election issue until we fix the root of the issue. We keep putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole, and constituency, the constituents are gonna continue to suffer at the pharmacy counter, to have inefficient healthcare delivery, and we've got to evolve. And so I think the discussion has absolutely um, evolved and it needs to continue. We now need to evolve to really fixing, fixing something that's you know, kind of stuck in a draconian system that really never put the patient first. We isolated the patient as a consumer and we need to put the consumer the patient as a consumer. It needs to be market driven, it needs to be understandable, it needs mm -hmm. to be efficient. Wow, so Donald Trump comes in, wants to get drug prices lower, uh, wants to have uh, more access, he says. What do you think, and I know you've spoken to him about this, what do you think we're not doing today that we need to do? You know, you hear a lot about transparency, and what I, I've spent a lot of time, obviously, after going through what transparency we... Transparency of prices, transparency of Transparency of, of pricing and just how it works. I think that we... So who do we blame on the high price of drugs? Like who's the th villain in the story? Not. I know we like villains. We like blood on the street, especially in this town. Okay, who's the hero in the story? There's not a hero. There's mm -hmm. not a villain or a hero. It's an, it would be asking, why is our education system outdated? Who are you blaming for that? It's, it's been a system that it's evolved for 30 years, and what, I, what has happened, what dramatically changed, and nothing kept up with it, is going into high deductible plans, mm. which people rightly so don't really understand what that means. They're trying to keep a premium low, and that therefore puts a huge out-of-pocket spend, and they're facing these prices that were never meant for a person to pay. We, we never put the patient, you were supposed to have a copay, you were supposed to have limited exposure. So it's, you know, let me ask you this, because I've thought a lot about how do we continue to articulate that there's not a person, um, there's no one to point a finger at. That's why it's difficult to solve for, because we don't like to take a whole lot of time to figure out the issue. You can only fix something if you know the problem. No, but I know you went on to uh, Morning Joe and, and with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski, who asked you pretty much who's the villain too. You gave them a chart, say, here, here are the drug companies and we're the known faces, then there are the pharmacy benefit managers, and then there's the other distributors. And, and, and you gave, it was the first time I had seen an ecosystem where everybody had their, um, uh, was getting a slice of the action, right? It, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was the, you know, it was the mafia, right? So um, who, when you look at that, and you're the front, so you're Mylan, or you've got a Mylan brand, or you're EpiPen, what are these other pieces doing that we're not seeing? Well, I think the first point is you're not seeing them. So, you know, you associate that there's someone making the medicine, inventing, researching, bringing the medicine to market, and then you're receiving it. And you don't realize kind of the complicated web behind the scenes to get from point A to point B, because the reality is it doesn't go from point A to point B. It goes from point A to, like, point M. 
and there's a lot of back and forth, and there's there everything had started from a good place. It started from how do we help people manage, administrate pharmacy benefit. Companies were have been giving health care to a, as a employee benefit for decades. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the ownership of your health needs to become much more individualized. And one of the concepts that, you know, I think really needs to be thought about, does it make sense that employers give health care to a broad brush of employees versus just similar like we did with retirement? I think we could all agree or disagree is 401k right way to handle retirement. It's probably better than an unfunded liability that you would have had nothing at the end of the day. And companies said, listen, you understand your retirement needs better than I do. We'll match funds. So, you know, I would put forth that as an individual, you know your health and you should be incentivized to have some skin in the game about, you know, maintaining being healthy. We also need to recognize that there's um, you know, pre-existing conditions, things that you're genetically predisposed to, and we're smart enough to figure that out. So if an employer said, you buy the health insurance for you, your family's needs, I'll match funds, I'll put money into your HSA account, and there, that way, it's now a market system. Life insurance, uh, car insurance, home insurance, you understand, and you understand there's some rules of the road, that if you drive too fast and get a ticket, your car insurance is gonna go up. Right. If you get a DUI, you're gonna get penalized. And I think that we have this sense, healthcare is an absolute right, but it's not an entitlement to live by no rules of the game and have no consequences. And I think that we're struggling as a society to how do we, we have one of the most inefficient healthcare systems in the world, yet we pay double of anybody else in the world. We rank, I think, 25th or 26th in the last World Health Organization. Do you want a single payer system? No, I don't think single payer. I think that th wouldn't that simplify things? It simplifies. That doesn't necessarily make it better. Would I'd, it make it cheaper? I think you could argue that yes, it could make it cheaper and not have better results. I would rather see a market-driven system that that individuals that we do what we do best in this country. We're, we demand the best, we demand it for less, we demand that competition keep people on their toes and you want the best, the best, the next best innovation, which w totally support. Innovation and access go hand in hand, but what has gotten turned upside down is there's not, the consumer's not playing a role in driving that competition. When you walk into a pharmacy and you're looking at over-the-counter medicine, you're deciding what brand, do you want the generic? Do you want the brand? You're going to pay more if you take the brand. You get to make those decisions and you understand financially what you're going to put out. If we could make healthcare work in a way that you are responsible mm -hmm. um, and driving that, the, that, this market responds pretty rapidly. I mean, you see the amazing evolution of technology. I mean, just think of everything from newspapers to everything in our lives has changed dramatically. And if you're not changing, you're mm -hmm. being left behind from a digital aspect, from how you run your business. So we need to get away from just it being business and system of running healthcare to, I think, and meeting the needs of individuals and putting that patient first. And look, it's a right. heavy lift. You are CEO of the second largest generics manufacturer in the world, maybe drug manufacturer in the world, um, and, and you're working on biosimilars and other things. I recently interviewed Scott Gottlieb, who wants to green light lots more work and development in that. So what's the coolest thing coming down the pike from your Wizard of Oz position that none of us know about that you know about? <laughs> Again, this is off the record, right? <laughs> totally. Um, so I couldn't be more excited about what's what's in our pipeline, just as a as but a short form, yeah, for, yeah. Like for, give us the best stuff. Bio, so look, biosimilars, biologics have changed. Do you think biosimilars is a good name. I, I didn't name it. Yeah. I would not say because it already makes you think. Well, it's not the same. Right, right. They they and this is where I think Dr. Gottlieb has tried to be doing a lot of education around the scientific standards that these biosimilars are are scientifically equivalent and. What I will first say is we've got a great pipeline, great products to bring access and affordability to these important drugs. You know, you look at Humira, you look at some of these drugs that are really what, what changing drugs? people's life. Like Those kind of drugs. 
Specifically, we just launched new Lasta. We've got a generic version of Advair coming, which is, you know, a very important uh, product, a very complex product. But here's the problem of where we're headed. We have 90% generic utilization in this country, which has really balanced that innovation and access, and it's worked pretty well. Mm. In this new world of complex products, these specialty products, we only have 10 to 15% generic utilization mm. because structurally, the, the system's just not allowing the access. So I was thinking about this. I know yesterday you interviewed Jose talking about Puerto Rico and a year after the storm. We're sitting there looking at millions of bottles of water on an airplane field. And we could all sit here and say, well, we could keep putting more water on that field. If it's not getting into a person's hands to drink the water, what good is it? So I would say a lot of conversations we've been having with the FDA mm -hmm. and HHS is, Dr. Gottlieb, FDA can keep approving products, and they are, at record rates. If we're not getting it into the hands of the people who need it, the continued approval is not going to mean more access. And I think people, it's, they, there's a, it's hard to, it's hard to practical, make that practical. People don't understand. They say, I don't understand. You get approval, and we launch the product. We right. do, but there's all this in the middle, formularies, your insurance, right. everything that's controlling how you get your health care is dictating what you're getting. It's, it's not you, your physician, and your pharmacist anymore. Give me a minute on the president's uh, tariffs. Are, are they helping you or hurting you? Or the, and I don't mean you. Yeah. I mean there's, the, the there is not, industry. I would say there's not a big impact on the generics industry right now from, from a tariff perspective because, you know, look, we are making tens of billions of doses for pennies on the dose, I mean, mm. as a selling price. So that ability to have volume and efficiency and provide that access is but at the got core of what we do. in China Every, and well, India we have it in, and, and all, all over, over the world. world. Um, and, you know, it's not, so it's not, there's more raw material coming out of China than there is finished dosage form. So, as Why you don't know, we make more of that in the United States? You know, it became too expensive um, to manufacture. We still do. We have one of the largest manufacturing facilities in the world here in the U.S., and it's, 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 you've got to very much have a large-scale operations right. to be able to absorb that cost. I mean, we've talked about this before, Steve, antibiotics. Mm. Strep throat, something that you know everyone's treating right. a child with. There, we make no antibiotics in this country. So if we had a free, if we had a trade war, um, and we have no strategic supply of antibiotics, we have no manufacturing capability. I mean, it it could something like that could mm -hmm. devastate this country that I don't think that we've given enough thought to, because again, as you know, as I think the this town knows better mm -hmm. than anyone. We want to be way at the surface, right. not take the time to really understand how do we fix it. You can't fix something mm -hmm. that you don't understand. And I think these conversations go a long way, hopefully to get people curious about, well, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. I'd right. like to understand a little bit more about how does it really work. And that's why, um, you know, I think that we've had the opportunity to somewhat, I think, be validated that there is a complex system, that there's, right. and it's not working for the patient. Um, Last question. I, I, you, you were the first uh, female CEO of a Fortune 500 biopharmaceutical firm, and I mean, I can't help but ask this. We're in a, an era of Me Too, of the Kavanaugh vote. Jeff uh, Goldberg asked Hillary Clinton um, on Tuesday whether she saw a kind of gender war building up. In short form, if you're a woman CEO in this business, um, are you fighting an uphill battle against the, you know, the guys? Are you treated differently? I mean, how are you treated in your position today? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no question that I think that women are facing much different obstacles, and I think those obstacles have evolved over time, and I think, you know, thank God we're at a moment where there, that, there's transparency there, and, and women are being heard, not just listen, you know, listen and heard. Um, I think that I've said this for a long time. All of us women could help each other, and we're not going to be able to move the needle because mm -hmm. there's not enough of us. It's going to take our fathers, our brothers, our sons, our husbands to respect the role of women in the workplace to make, to make this world work 
um, with all the potential that we have. Because right now we're only tapping a little more than half the potential, and we've got big problems to solve, and it's going to take all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Heather Bresch, CEO of Milan. Thank you so Thank much. You.